What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I am on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Deb Mashek, who just wrote a book called Collabo Hate, and what it is that makes collaboration so difficult. So be ready to dive deep. And by the way, if you enjoy the show and want to support it to remain free and accessible, then please consider a small donation via workshops.org slash support. And now, lean back to be inspired. Deb, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. And I'm full of curiosity to speak about collaboration with you since you just published a book with a very provocative name. And a very long name. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yes, and we'll get to that. And I always kick off the conversation with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? So uh, having listened to your podcast, I knew this one was coming. And I don't know that I call myself a facilitator, but I know I use tools of facilitation. And I was thinking about why is that? Like, why why am I tripping over that word for myself? And I think it has to do with the, the identity piece mm -hmm. where to, to somehow if I call myself a facilitator, it feels like I have to take on the whole identity that I am not yet familiar with because it still feels new and novel to me. So perhaps if I listen to more of your episodes, suddenly I'll be like, I'm totally a facilitator. But the first time that I did facilitation, I would say is, you know, my background is in higher ed. So first time I got to step into a classroom and to create the conditions for learning to happen and for co-learning and co-construction of knowledge to happen and to bubble up, I think it was probably the first time. And then the first time that I was hired by somebody outside of the classroom to come facilitate I was, I did work for, uh, there was an academic department at a college that was having some tensions bubbling up, trying to figure out, you know, what are we, how are we going to spend our time? What do we want to prioritize this semester? And a lot of sensitivities around, oh, that person is doing more work than that person. And so there was this sense of workload and equity. And, and I came in and we did a two day workshop around what really do we mean by work? What counts as work? What, how do we make work visible? What's valued here? And I realized those ultimately that was my first time creating that kind of sturdy container for the hard conversations to happen in service to uh, doing better together. Beautiful. Thank you. And yeah, there's already so much to unpack. <laughs> I find it interesting that many. I would say the majority of my podcast guests don't call themselves a facilitator for similar reasons than you do, that the label is too restrictive because facilitation for most is a tool to enable something. And I also wonder about the word as, so like, I feel like you're an expert facilitator where this is a content area of expertise that you have also mm. Whereas for me, it's I feel my content area of expertise is collaboration. And so somehow, I don't know, I, th there's something there too about what we know versus what we do versus who we are. Yes, yes, love that. And it's funny because for me, enabling collaboration is for me at the heart of facilitation. Mm -hmm. I think I just got off the, another call. Yeah. This I just got off another call where we were talking about collaboration as the problem that people struggle with versus collaboration as the outcome mm -hmm. versus collaboration as the, the symptom. Uh, you know, so it's a similar sort of thing. It's like, well, it depends on where we are in this interpersonal process that creates work we're doing together. Yeah. And then makes me think of the illusion of alignment when it comes to specific words that I use so often. So oh my God, alignment is one of the words that drives me crazy <laughs> um, because it's like, what the hell do we mean? But yes, illusion of alignment. I love that. Sorry to interrupt. But exactly that, that reason. Down, so, so if we say collaboration, what do we actually mean? And do we mean the same thing? And let's reveal the, the title of your book first. <laughs> 
Okay, so the title of the book is Collabor Hate, How to Build Incredible Collaborative Relationships at Work, even though, or even if you'd rather work alone. See, I can't even get my own title right. And I totally agree about this word collaboration. It is so vague. And there is all this rah-rah enthusiasm energy out there around it. I mean, it's it's freaking everywhere. Like everybody's talking about collaboration. Companies big and small adopt collaboration as a core value. But then you're like, so what does that mean? And you know, if you look at the word co-labor, it gives a lot of hints. It really it literally means together work. But there are so many different ways you could potentially work with somebody. So you and I could just exchange some information. We could alter our activities to you know advance a shared goal. We could share resources, whether that's expertise or machines or time or money. We could also learn from each other. So there are all these different qualities or characteristics of together work. And in my mind, because since I wrote a book, I, of course, had to put a definition in there. You know, in my mind, collaboration is two or more people who know each other working together intentionally to advance a shared goal. So there's still a lot of room in there for short term and long term, for hybrid versus in person, for formal and informal, but at least it's a little bit more, they were a little bit more constrained than just, oh, it's sorts of working together. I was in a conversation recently with some young workers in an office and they told me they collaborated on the day's lunch order and on creating the wall billboard and what was going to be on the display. And those feel maybe smaller. They don't feel like collaboration to me. They're like, oh no, you just coordinated. You shared some information about, you know, what, what do you want on the pizza? That's not the same as figuring out how to solve the world's you know biggest challenges or how to get this new amazing product to market really quickly, those sorts of things. So yeah, I have totally have a chip on my shoulder on the, what do you call it? The illusion, the illusion of alignment around the word collaboration. Yes, I wonder whether there is one that we all say collaboration, but means something different. And then we think of, yes, we subscribe all to the value of collaboration, but actually what, and I now, after your example, I assume that actually even in organizations, actually many might mean coordination or a negative definition of collaboration, where collaboration is the absence of working in silos and the absence of working against each other, which does not necessarily mean that they're collaborating. I also worry about weaponizing the word collaboration. So if there's, you know, if we're in a group, say a meeting, and I start using the word around collaboration, partner is another one where what does that mean? Or and what do I mean by weaponizing? It's like if I start lobbing that word without specificity or without a shared commitment to doing whatever we've defined this thing as, and in a way, am I constraining your ability to push against me or to have another perspective or to walk away? It doesn't tether the other people in the room in any way to my vision of what we're supposed to be doing before we've actually created that alignment. Those of you on audio can see I'm using scare quotes. <laughs> but yeah, like, so like, how do we go through this in a careful way so that everybody agrees, you know, we truly are partners in this, or we truly are collaborating versus somebody unilaterally saying, I, I ascribe to you, or I expect from you the, the behaviors and dispositions of a collaborator, even though that's not, mm-hmm. haven't necessarily committed my time, attention, or resources to serving in that role on your behalf. Yeah. And why do you think goes collaboration wrong? Yeah, I think that definition gets in the way a lot because people don't know what's expected of them or what they're supposed to be doing. I think I have a long list of ways that I think it goes wrong. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of my my favorites. I think another reason it goes wrong is because we assume that if you have people who are enthusiastic about collaboration, that they are therefore competent collaborators. So failing to differentiate that energy around equals capacity to. And we can loop back on as many of these as you want. And I think another one And it happens a lot in more formalized workplaces where you've got really great project management and project tools where people conflate 
processes and technology of collaboration with successful collaboration, forgetting that there's this very human relational element. Actually, those are two big ones. Yeah. Because we already and, talked about Yeah. Yes, I can totally see. So coming back to the first one, and I imagine the stereotype person who is over the top on collaboration and in their mind collaboration is to exchange on everything and to sit shoulder by shoulder and to work on this project together. Do everything together. Exactly. Where it can actually be harmful or destructive because it takes away productivity or where collaboration can just mean, yeah, having more chit chats about things and exchanging, then it's an ongoing brainstorming that never leads into action. Yeah. Or, you know, another one that drives me nuts is when they'll be in a group and somebody is so sweet and kind and they're volunteering to do everything. I'll take that. I'll take that. Sure. I can take that. You know, let me go ahead and follow up on that. And they volunteer for all of these things. When come to find out, they don't actually have capacity to do those things or they don't have the, you know, the right tools or resources to do them well. And then what happens, you come back to that group meeting, you know, it might be a standing meeting every week or every two weeks, you come back and come to find out that person wasn't able to do all of those things, or they did them in this very superficial, light way that doesn't actually provide the group with what it needs to move the project forward in a directed, energetic sort of way. And the person, you know, Oh, like I, I want to be around those people who are enthusiastic collaborators, but we also have to equip people with the habits of heart and mind to be able to say, you know, no, I, I can't do that. If I say yes to this right now, it's ultimately hurting our shared goals because I don't have capacity right now to do this and we need to make that okay. But it takes a lot of self-awareness about capacity and know-how as well as that the group dynamic to make it okay to say, I I can't do it all right now. I need help. So there's a lot at play. And the leadership capacity to define roles and responsibilities? Yes. Beyond, I guess this would be another, another one of my how collaboration goes wrong, because it's related to that is leadership saying we value collaboration. You know, they'll like put a stencil on the wall or put a new value word at the bottom of the letterhead. And then not do much more beyond that. So saying that, oh, well, just because we say we value collaboration, therefore people will be able to collaborate and not quite fully appreciating that there are all these other steps involved, like defining roles and responsibilities in order for the collaboration to be successful. Yeah. Attention, all aspiring leaders and facilitators. Are you ready to take your leadership skills to the next level? Well, I have some exciting news for you. This is Miriam. I'm your trusted host here on Workshops Work. As you listen to this podcast, you know about the superpower of facilitation as a leadership skill already. So if you want to leverage the impact of your work by engaging stakeholders, fostering collaboration, building psychological safety and driving accountability, I have something for you. My brand new Leadership Through Facilitation course. I will show up live for you to be your guide as we explore the art of facilitation and its impact on effective leadership. Over the years, I've had the privilege of leading countless workshops and learning from more than 200 podcast guests. Now, I am thrilled to share my expertise with you. I've designed an experience for you to learn from me, my podcast guests, as much as you will learn from yourself and from your peers on the course. Imagine the impact you'll make as a leader who can bring people together, drive collaboration, and achieve outstanding results. This course is perfect for process managers who want to unlock their leadership potential and impact through the power of facilitation. So if you're ready to embark on this journey with me, Visit workshops.work slash course to learn more and secure your spot. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. So thank you for tuning in today. I can't wait to see you on the Leadership Through Facilitation course. And now, enjoy the rest of the podcast episode. Thanks for your attention. 
And then related to the other point that you made, the to have the tools and the tech ready. So yes, it can be confused that collaboration is just using these tools and tech. But on the other hand, it can be a wonderful enhancer or facilitator of the collaboration. And if you don't have it, I'm thinking of the early months or maybe the first year of the pandemic, where in many companies, collaboration suddenly almost collapsed because there were no communication channels in place. And they didn't have all the tools to actually track each other's progress and keep each other informed. Yeah. So that my mind goes two places there. One is a story and the other is a metaphor. The story is I was talking to a, a client who they have a project manager who is an absolute maven at all things processes. They can, you know, put together a, a workflow and asana checklist, a, you know, for anything and really, really detailed. And, you know, this person knows where the deadline is on something, everything gets backed out and it looks exquisite. And you would think, oh, so there's a good collaborator. No, because this person is also incredibly rigid, such that if anybody expresses concern or, you know, I don't really understand what this item is on my Asana checklist, they get these really rude responses like, what are you talking about? We already went over that. Or if somebody says, you know, I can't get X, Y, and Z done, I'm overloaded. Well, we talked about it and you said you could. And there's like this disdain for the people part. So really great technologist, you know, in terms of being able to use technologies of collaboration, really clear processes. But in the absence of interpersonal skills, Mm. there's no collaboration. People do not look working with this person. People avoid him. You know, so it's examples like that help illustrate why it's not just about technology and tools, how you need to have that interpersonal grace, high relationship quality, I would call it as well. And then to the, the metaphor. I, you know, people sometimes, and maybe we can talk about this, you know, want to talk about collaboration and hybrid versus virtual versus in-person spaces. And what was striking for me when we went, you know, for a lot of us from fully in-person to fully remote in March, 2020 is like you said, some collaborations totally fell apart. Others didn't, you know, others were perfectly fine. And so, you know, what I want to ask as a good social psychologist is like, what were the moderating variables? Why, you know, what was working for whom under what conditions, that sort of thing. And here's my hot take is that it's a lot like closing time at the pub where, you know, all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever it is, they're like, you know, it's closing time and the lights click on. and suddenly you can see really for the first time how gross the bar was all along. So like there's that (laughs) sticky stuff on the counter. There's like an inch of dust on the photo, the picture frames hanging above the register. And of course those were there all along. It's not like they just magically appeared, but what happened, I think with the pandemic and that transition from fully in-person to fully remote was, was like closing time where suddenly we, we saw the fault lines and the collaborations, even though those had been all there all along. But when we were in person, they could kind of be, you know, papered over and we could ignore them a little bit and we could bypass bad process because we could go, we could just go check in with Miriam who was sitting, you know, across the hallway, those sorts of things. So that's my metaphor, closing time. I love it. I love it. Yes, I was usually referring to an amplifier. That the fully remote suddenly amplified everything that was wrong already. As if all the meetings were fantastic when we were in person. Not at all. It's just that now you realize how little participation there actually was once people come online. I love the closing for it. Yeah. And they're getting at the same thing. They're like, it's shining a really harsh, undeniable light on crappy, crappy processes and habits. Yeah. And you mentioned a couple of times the personality of people, the one who is very rigid, although being perfectly transparent. And I think transparency and process and roles and responsibility and communication, all of these are part of collaboration. Do you think that it's 
something that we can learn? Or is it intrinsic? Are people just, I can imagine that some people are better collaborators just because they're more communicative or clear or adaptable. Yeah. So at some point, maybe we could talk about the Mashic matrix, which for me really emphasizes the learnable parts of collaboration. But then there's also this idea that, of course, all of us have dispositions. We are people with histories, learning histories, experiences, both with other relationships, including foundationally our, you know, the relationships we had growing up that taught us about whether we're, you know, worthy of love and care and affection and whether it's okay to lean on other people or whether other people mm -hmm. can be even be responsive to our needs, those sorts of things. So those learning histories, in addition to innate personality differences, set up, I think, the dispositional aspects of collaboration. So there's that. And then there's also these learning histories where if I was in a my last workplace, you know, theoretically, imagine it was like this really horrible place to collaborate. And I, I left there with a lot of burn marks, with a lot of distrust, with a lot of guardedness about if somebody else was going to steal my ideas or place blame for failures or any of those things. Like now that's, unfortunately, those experiences are now in my backpack that I have to carry along with me. So all of those relational experiences, we carry with us into the workplace. It's not like somehow, you know, the things I'm struggling with on, you know, on the home front with a spouse, somehow those just go away. When we walk through those office doors, they certainly don't go away when we walk through the, oh, just over to the kitchen table to turn on the Zoom meeting, as opposed to like, I don't know, turn the other way and, you know, see the, the laundry pile. But those things are, they're present, they're with us and they're real and they totally influence how we approach and engage our, our workplace relationships, i.e. collaborations. How can we take this then into account? Because then suddenly... Now I realize what a bit big ask it is to participants to step into a workshop and there we are, the facilitators. Let's collaborate and let's share our ideas. Let's challenge each other's ideas and build on what everyone said and feel safe. How can we then get the setup right to at least have the environment or or do we need to clarify it first to understand everyone's kind of baggage they're bringing into the workshop space? And I mean, that last idea is interesting, but then you think about nobody has time for that. Like, what are we going to do? Dedicate, you know, two weeks of preamble to unpacking all of that before we could do our two hour workshop. It's like, no, that, you know, that's not actually going to be viable. I don't have any easy answers. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but I do, you know, what bubbles up for me is like, we absolutely have to provide different ways that people can engage, have to be okay with the idea that not everyone's going to be able to for whatever their, their reasons are. And if I, you know, I'm a big fan of asking as many questions before the, the workshop as possible, whether it's through a survey with liker items or some open-ended responses, just so I can get a, a lay of the land to know kind of what might be present in the room with me when I move in to, to facilitating. But what are your magic tricks? Because <laughs> that's such a good question. I've never thought of that. But what came to my mind were differences in personality types, like the speak to think and the think to speaker. And for team workshops, I love to ask them the question, do you think to speak or speak to think? And what's the impact on the work we'll, we're about to do together? Because I'm a speak to thinker. So if I start speaking, something will emerge in my brain and eventually it will all make sense. But someone who thinks to speak, they might get so frustrated to just listen to my blubbering. Well, yeah, uh, speak to think type as well. So And similar, so I think just voicing it and building empathy that there are these differences and that it might make sense to work around it or take it into consideration. And why I'm thinking of that was that I actually thought of something else before is our relationship to conflict and how this plays out. There are some who with 
one slight argument or someone contradicting, they think that their relationship will fall apart and others are very used to loud and heavy arguments. And maybe with collaboration, it's similar. So with one check-in question yeah. on what is actually our trauma history, <laughs> small t, <laughs> with collaboration, just to get it out, because if I can share the story that when I was five year old, someone stole my idea. And since then I'm quite protective. We have a laugh, but then everyone understands if, if I act a little bit weirdly. Yeah. When my kiddo was eight, he came home and that was the first time he had a group project. He hated it because some girl got really bossy boss about what everyone was supposed to do. Like she totally took, took all of the authority and just assigned people tasks and everybody ended up creating this game they didn't want to do because that's what she wanted to do. So I do think we start packing that baggage really early. I do think it's worth asking, you know, what, here, here's a question. I mean, here are two questions that I use in my workshops as well as my, in my research. So people are welcome to use these. The first one on a scale from zero to 100, where zero equals collabor hate and 100 equals collabor great. What are your thoughts on workplace collaboration? So you can get everybody to give a number. And it's fascinating because you see variants. You'll see p- some people in the group will hate it and some people will love it. And then you can say, this, the question you asked, how might this variance inform what we're going to try to do together today? Mm, so love that question is, love that one. Another one, you can do it right now. Three words or phrases describe your true feelings about workplace collaboration. Mm. Put you on the spot here for me. Yeah. Complexity. Mm-hmm. Creativity. I love watching your mind at work. This is fun. <laughs> of the different corners where my thinking yeah, goes yeah. and um productivity yeah so a couple positives in there i think i might tag complexity as having some positive and negative perhaps valence around that it's going to take effort it's going to take you know there there's the possibility there for confusion or for a lot of care and conscientiousness to get all the c words out so what we do sometimes in you know, a group setting is I'll just throw those into a word cloud and you can start seeing different words pop up and elevate. And um, in the research, what I see is people use a lot of positive words like promise and potential and it's fun and it's inspiring, but there are also these negative words that pop up like it's risky, it's, you know, it's hard, it's confusing, things like that. And so to highlight that for the group, to say, you know, this is not kumbaya, everything's going to be, you know, icing on the cake that it's so easy to work together. This is like the bee's knees, but to say, so why the heck are we doing it? What's at stake if this goes really well? What's at stake if this absolutely, you know, the bottom falls out of it? And what can we do now that we know that people have some apprehensions? What can we do as a group to protect against those? Or how do we take care of each other? What outcomes do we actually value from this? So let's don't say we need this one little collaboration to do, be everything for everybody. Let's specify it and figure out how we're going to work towards this particular thing. So yeah, so people definitely have mixed feelings about it. So let's bring that to the fore. Now, I wonder whether there is some Dunning-Kruger <laughs> related to the to collaboration. If I've never collaborated, I don't know what it is. If I collaborated a little bit and then maybe done in quicker, well, and then I overestimate. So I, all I know is what I expect. And, or if I know just a little bit, then I have these naive visions of what we can do with collaboration. But then the more I collaborate, the more I realize the nuances and the difficulties and complexity. And I think especially nowadays where everyone speaks about diversity, yes, diversity is great, but it's so difficult to collaborate in a diverse environment because everyone has different ideas, has different ways how to work, how to organize themselves, might have different stakes in the game or their own agenda, different working times. And different vocabulary around it. So there's different jargon, there's different timelines, different 
outcomes that are valued, different code words that you're allowed to say or not to say, and separate from like the jargon and the vocabulary, but they're it's like, where are the eggshells for this conversation? And it just, it starts to feel like adding to my vision and trying to carry a huge bowl of water, you know, across the, <laughs> across the river. <laughs> oh, I can't do this. It's precarious. And the idea of like, how do we make working together less precarious? Yes. Those who love last minute as opposed to those who want to be finished on time. And I, speaking from the perspective of a facilitator, I love the idea to collaborate on a workshop together. And I love co-facilitating in the space with someone. But the process of developing a session together with me rather being intuitive and maybe last minute And then maybe someone wants to have a more, wants to be finished in advance, wants to have lots of calls and talk everything through. And me thinking, I don't have time for that. Let's wing it. Right. And it starts to feel really heavy and onerous for you. And then the other person, because I'm on the other side, I would start to be so stressed out the closer we got to it. Like, oh my gosh, we still haven't had the call. We don't know what we're going to do. I have an example of this. I was co-facilitating a workshop with somebody from a particular industry and his job was to write a detailed case study applying our concepts to the industry and we talked about it and he was totally all in yep we're going to do that I'm going to do that in a, a week before the facilitation I was like okay so I haven't seen a draft yet can I see that because I'm going to need it for what I'll be doing next a couple of days before I haven't seen it night before he calls me and he's like, I don't think it makes any sense to do a case study. I've been thinking about it and it just, it's not a good fit for what we're trying to do. And it's not going to make any sense to the audience. And it was really hard for me to say, and I kept it together. (laughs) But I said, so useful feedback would have been useful a week ago. I don't know what to do with that right now because we're going into this, and this was like at 10 o'clock at night, we're going into the session tomorrow at nine and waiting for this piece so that we can develop my part. And and he said, I, I forget exactly how we reconciled it, but it ended up being like, okay, well, we'll, we'll wing it a little bit. Listen, this will be an experiment for me. And then in the session, he was such a prince. He told everybody, he's like, pause really quick and tell the group about what's going to be happening next. And he used it as a teaching moment about our collaboration to this group of industry professionals. And it ended up all working out. But I don't remember how that phone call ended the night before. But it was just one of those things like, I loved the idea of co-facilitating. And then it got really scary for me as we got closer. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to actually choose our collaborators wisely and to have an open, honest conversation on what we need in order to feel comfortable because none of us wants to have sleepless nights before, although we might be different. And I think the diversity and the different personalities are really what are enriching the session if it's a live session afterwards or in any collaboration. That's what brings the extra spice in it. But if it's hurtful and painful and draining before that, You know, and a couple of things on that. We know that the higher our relationship quality is with our collaborators, it correlates with lower anxiety, lower depression, more workplace satisfaction, less likely to be out looking for a job. So you don't want your collaborators in the workplace having sleepless nights because that means they're flight risk or, uh, you know, frankly. So there's that. And then I love this point about when should we say no to the opportunity to collaborate? Because Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think that gets enough airtime. You know, it's like any other relationship. You want to, you want to be opting in (laughs) intentionality. You don't want to just settle for, you know, the spouse or just, you know, settle for the best friend. It's like, no, develop that relationship in a real way. And so in the book, I talk about when to say no to an opportunity to collaborate. And the first It's just four questions you can ask yourself. The first question is, is this opportunity actually aligned with my values and interest? Because guess what? If it's not, 
I don't care if you're like the most skilled person and you'd be working with the most amazing collaborators, you're going to burn out. You're not going to have fun doing this thing, or you're going to feel like it's taking away your attention and resources from the other things that you really care about. So when we have discretion, saying no to the things that are not value aligned are important. The next question is, do I actually have the ability to contribute meaningfully to -hmm. this collaboration? And by that, I mean two things. So do I have time for this? Because how often do we end up saying yes to things that we really don't have space in the proverbial plate for? And what it means is we stress ourselves out. We're also likely burning bridges with other people because we're not able to do what we've said we're going to do as meaningfully or as deeply or as well as we know and they know that we're capable of. And so it looks like we're you know, giving this shared project a, a short shift. I also mean by are you able to contribute meaningfully? Heart of hearts, do you really have the right skill sets this project needs? You know, like I'm going to bring some unique added value to this shared work we're doing. I think that's important. Number three would be, does the other person actually have the capacity to contribute meaningfully? Meaning if they're a flaky collaborator and you know that they drop the balls and don't do what they say they're going to do, and you've seen this across multiple projects, guess what? The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Pay attention to that. Give yourself permission to pay attention to it. And also, do they have you know the time? So we all know this people in our in our worlds, and I worry that I'm one of them who's just like busy all the time, and it's hard to get on you know the calendar for the 15 minute check in. And so it's you know if that person is going to be your partner, do you really want to go all in with them, knowing that there, there will be repercussions for you? on their capacity issues. And then the fourth question has to do with resources. So are the resources that are available actually aligned with the the scope and the vision, this thing Mm -hmm. that we're going to be trying to do together? And it's not saying that you can't create amazing things on a shoestring, because I think you absolutely can. But if uh, you can bring on resources in advance, imagine how much easier it'll be to do this complicated thing of collaboration. Yes. And you don't want to get into a fight of frustration because all of these visions and ideas cannot be implemented because of external restrictions and challenges. Yeah. Yes. And I I think there is a general struggle to say no because of all different kinds of fears of rejection and letting people down and fear of missing out and all these things. And I think what we often or including myself, what I often forget is if I say yes to that thing, what am I actually saying no to? So what are the opportunity costs of a collaboration? And I think that's something that we often forget. Because then, as you say, sometimes it's just the 15 minutes check-in or just the extra reading. And if this frustrates me all the time and I'm taking away this time from something that I'm actually passionate about, it cannot be yeah. healthy. Right. Or sustainable or mm-hmm. happy making. And for me, one of the big themes here is I don't think we should be collaborating on everything. I don't think that we should collaborate because it's the quote right thing to do or you know it's what we're supposed to do it's like you collaborate on things because you or someone else has made a compelling case that it makes good sense to go through all of this effort um, and work in service to the shared goal that it is actually something you're interested in and you value so it's you know we don't collaborate for the fun of it we collaborate because it clearly relates to the the interest of the individuals i feel like there's a i'm all for you got to have self interest if you're going to go through all of this there's got to be something in it for you yeah and there must be a bigger interest so everyone must contribute positively and then the whole must grow bigger than its parts otherwise it doesn't make sense that's right. where my, my eco- economics background comes in yes yes I, yeah, you, you've got a, a chart in your mind, right? Of like, where are those, where's that cut point? <laughs> yes. How can organizations create the environment context or the ecosystem where collaboration can potentially flourish so that collaboration becomes 
possible beyond just the extra bullet on the letterhead, as you said. Right, beyond a name only. And I love the word ecosystem there. As a social psychologist, I, you know, the lens I go through the world with is this idea that our behavior is a function of who we are and the environment you're in. So if you want the collaborative behaviors that we're all celebrating, um, for me, it starts with hiring and providing professional development to the people so that they can be good collaborators. So hire good collaborators, invest in development as a collaborator. And then that idea of the person and the environment, when I think about the environment, there are kind of these, these three layers. One is who have I surrounded myself with so that the social environment, so other people who value collaboration, who are likewise invested in developing themselves as good collaborators, good communicators, good follow through, you know, basic project management, basic time management, those sorts of things that reduce the friction uh, when it comes to working together. Then another piece of that environment is providing, as, as the organizational leader, providing the tools and insisting on the processes that are going to make it easier to work together. So whether it's project management, you know, a known project management structure or a known way of bringing people together in a workshop setting to, to think through what could we do together? How are we going to do it? Having the right tools, whether it's access to, you know, like you said, when we transitioned to remote in March, 2020, a lot of people had never played with Zoom before. And suddenly we had to get this new tool to make mm. collaborations possible. Well, some people didn't even have each other's phone numbers. There wasn't a, a contact tree, um, you know, like old school trying to get together the baseball team. <laughs> like, do we have people's at home cell phone numbers? Where is that stored? It's somewhere in HR. Are we allowed to share it? You know, these really basic ways of how do we now allow people to communicate. And that to me is part of that environmental piece around the structures we put in place to facilitate collaborative work. And then but the, the kind of the outer layer of that ecosystem. So thinking, you know, kind of the onion piece, we think about what culture really means within an organization and what does it mean to have a quote collaborative culture beyond, you know, the bullet point on the letterhead. And there's a, another social psychologist who's done some thinking around this, around the open science movement, which is neither here nor there. But he has these really five fabulous questions that he and his colleagues ask. This is Brian Nozick. And he and his colleagues ask about whether or not science is transparent. I think work beautifully when we think about whether or not collaboration is part of the culture in an organization. The questions are, is it possible? In the first place, is it easy? Is it rewarding? Is it normative? And is it required? And you can think of those as these five different kind of layers in a pyramid. And when you think about is it easy, you can look at your organizational infrastructure. Do we have things in place like a meeting room where people can go with lots of sticky notes and whiteboards and fresh markers? Do we have a digital whiteboard? like a mural or a Miro? Do we have Zoom? So these really basic infrastructure things. So is it possible? Is it easy? So do we have processes in place? Is it normative? Are we actually celebrating collaboration when we see it? Is this just the way we do business? Or do we say we value collaboration, but really all we do is reward competitive behaviors and individual outcomes? And then thinking about, is it, and that goes to the, like, is it rewarded and incentivized? Is it visible? Can we see other people doing it? And then sometimes you have to make it required. Like, no, you've got to run this idea, you know, through multiple feedback from multiple departments before you're going to get the green light and so on. So that's a really long answer to your great question about ecosystem. So to summarize that behavior is a function of the person and the environment. So if you want that behavior, Pay attention to both, both pieces of that equation. And I love the answers. Thank you for taking the time. Because also the, yeah, the reward models that organizations have. So yes, they're putting collaboration as company value, but then the bonus system only takes into account individual behavior. And I was 
when I was still in academia, it made me so frustrated that everyone said we need to we need to incentivize and foster interdisciplinary research, but then there is no no recognized interdisciplinary journal in which we could publish. So there is no incentive actually to do interdisciplinary research and to go through all this pain. And in some academic disciplines, if you were to show up as a co-author, then it's not as an important of a contribution. It's not going to be weighed as heavily in your review, promotion, and tenure cases. And others, it's like, oh, if there are 20 authors, oh, you must not have done anything. So in psychology, there, there's a, and some other social sciences, a, a move toward these really large scale replication studies where you'll end up with like 20, 50 authors. And there are some people who are like, well, those don't really count because what are you, number 36? Like, did you really do anything on the paper? Is that really valuable? Which is so toxic because of course everybody did something important. And it, it's so what are we valuing here? The individual or the collaboration? Yeah. And who are we to judge then what kind of number of, instead of saying, oh, wow, isn't it amazing that you were able to write a paper and to conduct a study in collaboration with 30 other scientists, instead of celebrating that, to basically diminishing and say, this cannot be real collaboration. Right. As though I know somehow by looking at it from the outside. And, you know, in the corporate space, there are examples, actually, here's a nonprofit example where there's a fundraising team and the fundraising team says our goal is to raise 10 million this year. There are five people. And ask yourself, does the dashboard, that little, you know, thermometer that everyone's looking at every week to see how much money we've raised, does it say how close are we to 10 million? Or does it say how much have each of the five of you independently raised toward that 10 million? And if you, if it's truly a collaborative or it should be focused on how close are we to the 10 million, not how much of the, you know, like the 10 divided by five, how much of the 2 million that you need to bring in have you brought in? Wow. Yes. And then it's interesting actually how the ecosystem shapes the collaborative spirit and vice versa. So do you have the incentives putting in place collaboration and rewarding it? And because, so I think one can impact the other. If you have very competitive people, they might destroy the collaborative spirit. But then if you look at the wrong things or highlight the wrong things, like the individual effort instead of the team effort, can also destroy it. Yeah. Yeah. So I totally agree that these are mutually amplifying and mutually limiting. And I think, you know, at the top of the hour, we were talking about what do people get wrong and you know, there's kind of this sense of like, oh, thinking enthusiastic collaborators equals good collaboration or great tools and processes equals great collaboration or throwing the value on the letterhead and doing nothing else equals great collaboration. And to me, the real take-home point is, of course, all of those are important. And if you do any of them in isolation from the others, it's, it's like cooking without salt. You're leaving so much potential on the table. The real magic has been you. And it takes a lot of work, but when you think holistically about how all of these things are related, and that's where you're you're gonna get amazing timelines, amazing bottom lines, amazing innovation, and incredibly happy team members. Yeah. And one thing that just popped up in my mind is collaboration with AI. So we spoke about the yes, collaboration is such a personality and human thing. What are your thoughts on collaborating with AI, with ChatGPT? What can we learn about collaboration? And how do companies actually need to change their ecosystem or inform their people to be ready for that? Yeah, such a fun question. I was at the big TED conference in Vancouver in the middle of April, and so many conversations and speakers, um, AI in particular, and then the other thing is I wish I had had a kept a tally of how many times the word collaboration or collaborator or collaborate was mentioned on, on the stage because it's like everybody was talking about it. And this idea of, so what does it mean to collaborate with, and I'll, I'll maybe broaden it a little bit to say collaborate with technology mm -hmm. or 
you know, in a more general sense, because there are so many industries where the the humans and the robots are intimately collaborative already, um, where this is just already set up or where people are, you know, co-authoring with chat GPT or other AIs or where, you know, technologists are using or artists are using artificial intelligences to create, you know, deep fakes or it looks like somebody from your past is there with you having a conversation, but it's just a really good skin on a, on an avatar, those sorts of things. And I think, you know, in my heart, I get nervous and I'm so excited to see what happens. And I feel like we need to have a, a more conversations about what counts as good collaboration. What are the the guide rails that we want to put around the ethics and whatnot? I got to listen a little bit to your episode you did where you interviewed yes. uh, Chat GPT, which is so clever. I mean, did you? I, I guess one question for you is: Did you learn something new through the collaboration, through that conversation? Yes, so many levels, and I think the least I learned was on the content. So this was one of the biggest learnings for me that a good conversation is not about the content. It's about all that happens around the content and the dance, the inspiration, the wonder, the curiosity. This is what makes a good conversation. Yeah. That a good conversation helps you think further for yourself and not necessarily just absorb more knowledge. I love that. Yeah. And the other thing that I learned in the conversation and my collaboration with ChatGPT afterwards was how about my own precision in asking for information and how often I get it wrong with humans where I assume that they can read my mind and that they know exactly what I mean. And then I get frustrated if they don't answer my question in a way that I expect it. Whereas with ChatGPT, I'm like, oh, apparently I wasn't precise enough. Let me rephrase that for you. Right. And how interesting would it be if we as humans were better at saying, you know what, I don't know what you mean there, or here's what I'm hearing you say. Yes. Um, so I'm going to answer that. Is that what you really want me to answer? <laughs> no, or like ChatGPT saying, I am very sorry, but I am a machine learning thing and I don't have emotions. So I cannot answer this question for you. But here's what most people think. Right. According to my quick read of existing text, <laughs> I haven't done any deep writing with ChatGPT in part because I feel no, those won't be my words. And then for me, it's like, I don't want somebody else's words uh, representing or me using those or claiming those as my ideas. So the idea of co-writing with G- GPT has been something I've been hesitant to do. Mm. But a, a friend encouraged me, it was like, just go ask some questions about collaboration and see what comes up. And so I had said, like, what are the top or tell me about what goes wrong and when working with other people at work or something like that, what are the the top three frustrations or something like that? And chat GPT generated a, a great list. And then I said, let's talk about the first one. What is the evidence to support that this is one of the concerns? Had great evidence. And then I asked for a citation. So what evidence, you know, give me a citation. I'm a, I'm a researcher. Like, I want to see what that looks like. Provided a citation. Awesome. Provide me a link to the article, provided a URL, they clicked on the link, there was no paper there. So then I, I went into PsycInfo with the original, which is a, a research database with that citation that ChatGPT had offered. I put it in and the article didn't exist. It was totally made up from scratch. And when I was at the TED conference, I talked to a, a AI technologist and I shared that story. He said, there is a specific word for what you experienced. It's called a hallucination, like a hallucination around citation that just because it's, you know, predictive text, it's like, oh, this is, and it totally sounded like an academic citation, but it was a fun little learning experience. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, I love it when this happens. Well, I love it and I hate it. It makes me laugh because it, how ChatGPT just invents information and just shows. sounds good. Yeah. And it shows that you actually need to know 
what you're searching and what you need to know quite a lot in order to leverage your knowledge and collaborate with ChatGPT. Because yeah. otherwise you fall into the trap that you, you're you not sure what you're actually relying on. Right. So that whole idea of being a critical thinker and being discerning about your sources and how do you verify, those are all really good skills of the, the mind that you know, we, we teach in middle school and high school and college. And now it's ChatGPT is creating a, another way we have to be thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. According to you, what makes a workshop fail? Uh, so for me, one so the workshops that I'm doing, like when I when I'm in it, it's often not about something just about what's happening inside the room. So it's not a closed container. There's something that needs to happen afterward. But you know, we're we're creating a plan to go do something or we're, you know, we know we have this need. We're trying to figure out which of 10 options we want to pursue and then we have to go do it. So for me, what makes it fail is when the energy and the enthusiasm and the interest and the work that just happened in the room doesn't carry forward into directed action towards some sort of a shared goal. So yeah, that's when I, come on, there we, we have a thing. Like, to do the thing. And if, if that doesn't happen, that feels to me like that wait, something didn't happen right in the room to enable that forward action. Mm, yeah. And it happens so often. It's so easy to get excited and to be in this, this protected space where you get to be there with other people and think just these big thoughts and block out the outside world it's so easy to then walk out the door and the next day all these big aspirations fall by the wayside. Yeah. And I wonder whether it has to do with the parameters that you cited at, that we need in the ecosystem for sustainable collaboration. Because as you said, in a workshop, we're creating this perfect world holding space for collaboration. But then what happens afterwards once you take this protected space away actually has to rely on the systems, the processes, the tools. Is it easy? Is it feasible? And it also, you know, the the whole who needs to do what by when, and we, we need to know what the next step is. You know, what is when you leave here, what is the very next thing you do, no matter how small that gets this moving forward. And I also, you know, related to this idea of Power and can you compel people to collaborate? I want agency and individual autonomy and decision making and relatedness. But I also think it's really important and valuable to have somebody appointed as the caretaker of the collaboration, the person who's like the collaboration doula or the Sherpa who's scheduling the meetings, grabbing the minutes, um, reminding people what the action items are that came out of it. So there's some project management in there. But who can provide the almost that glue that holds everybody together? And I think one of the reasons collaborations often fail is nobody wants to step in to that role because they feel that it's forcing somebody else's hand or that it's in, or creating an imbalance of power or input. And I think other people actually value it. Was like, oh, I'm so glad you you sent sent around that calendar reminder or something like that. But there's a tension there of collaboration among equals, but also mm. having somebody who's truly holding or creating that sturdy container. Yeah, the facilitating. There's yeah. the word. Yeah, it's basically it's a facilitator, and I I think that project managers and product managers are truly those who often lack facilitation skills because it's neglected or they don't have a word for it. And we see it from scrum masters, for instance, they are facilit that's exactly what they do, right? They facilitate yeah. this collaboration and send reminders and hold the space and the little check boxes. And when someone starts giving this really rote report out at the daily stand up of I'll continue doing today what I worked on yesterday. No, no impediments. Does that person have the presence of mind and heart to go have the converse, the difficult conversation of, you know, look, 
that's not a high quality contribution <laughs> to what we're trying to do. What's going on for you? What you know? What really is present? If that's a, a relational facilitation. It may or may not be in that person's wheelhouse. Thank you so much for this example. I think very many in the audience just sit there and laugh or nod because it's, oh, let's keep the meeting short. Nothing to report. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's a missed opportunity. Also because collaboration, I think, can can be relational purely. It doesn't have to be on a specific task or project. A collaboration can happen by peer support. I'm here to listen to you or if you do have a problem. That's a collaborative spirit, at least. Yeah. And the hit that I just had, as you were saying, that was around what it means to be in collaborative relationships outside of work. So with your family, with your friends, with the neighborhood watch group, you know, with the church community, things like that, where it's not that there's some task that your boss is assigning, but what does it mean to have that openness? having both interdependence with other beings, as well as investing in the relationship quality so that you can have that beautiful, magical place of collaborate, you know, where you have those things together. What does it look like to do that with your kids? What does it look like to do that with your spouse versus someone being, for instance, the project manager or the the decider on all things? Yeah. And does it always or mostly imply a conversation on eye level because when I hear you speaking also about the you want the collaborator the facilitator of collaboration as someone who supports without directing who so what's the role of hierarchy in there yeah this gets to if I can anticipate one of your other questions about what's most challenging yes for me in facilitating and it's just that issue where I want to be supportive and holding, you know, sometimes I use the word I'm a collaboration concierge, I'm there to make this happen for you. And by virtue of, you know, I've been studying and facilitating these collaborations for lots of years. I mean, my, I've been studying and researching close relationships for two and a half decades. And it's like, I do know something about what works and why for whom. And so there's this tension of not wanting to strong arm, you know, processes, but also seeing like, okay, what you're doing is going to take you all to a dark place really quickly. So, you know, stepping in, but I'm not truly a neutral Mm. person. It's like, I am holding whatever you've defined as your shared needs and goals. I am here to nurture the relationships that are going to make that happen, which is a big challenge because with these issues around hierarchy and power. And I really don't have a say in the final outcome. And if you've entrusted me to hold that as my primary goal is to make that thing happen, I'm going to assert myself sometimes around your process, your group is using. So it it gets really twisty. Yes. And this opens uh, a Pandora box of an entire different (laughs) tangent or topic on power, power dynamics and the distribution and how how it can actually, yeah, maybe destroy facilitation. Or sometimes also sometimes fuel facil- collaboration. Right. Yeah. And for me, it brings up, again, the questions of transparency and explicitness. Like, have we mm-hmm. making this explicit? Because maybe it's not bad. Maybe it's bad and or counterproductive when it's happening, but we're unable to see it or name it. Like, it's become invisible or implied, or people say we're all getting together to come up with a great new plan for this thing. But actually, there's already something that's been determined by the powers up above. And it's like this, you know, opportunity to collaborate and come together in name only, but it's really very performative. And it's not going to be listened to on the back end by the executives or the administrators. That drives me crazy, because what you're it's like, okay, well, what you're doing is burning all the bridges and trust with those people who are investing time and attention and hope and possibility in the shared work. And if you do that, they're never coming back on. You're not going to get that back. So there's a lot at stake. Yeah. We call that facipulation. 
facilitated manipulation when actually everything has been decided already and you just have the theater. Wow, that is yeah. such a good word for it. I like the theater. And what? how, how do you say the other one? Facipulation. Facipulation, right. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Thank you. What a topic. And I just... um yeah, invite the listeners to get a copy of your book to dive deeper into the concepts of collaborate and collaborate. Yeah, thank you. And take a look. And I love being in conversation with people. So reach out either on LinkedIn or you can subscribe to the newsletter. It's just a twice monthly where I'm always trying to give a concrete tip about how to do this whole collaboration thing better. And I don't know if it would be useful, but I do have a cool image of the ecosystem. Since we talked about an ecosystem model, I happen to have one. So I can send that to you and make it available to people if they'd like to take a look too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.